Hey guys, uh, Acts chapter 17, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but growing up at, at, uh, as a grade school or a high schooler, guys, maybe there are some uh, of those who people or teachers may have said, oh, oh, here comes trouble. You know, they see these guys walking down the hall. They said, here comes trouble. I don't know, maybe you recognize that moniker. Maybe you recognize that title. Maybe you, you had a big sign around your neck, trouble, it said. <laughs> And they recognize that. You know, I don't know about that. You know, I, I think I see some smiles out there. You guys kind of recognize that. Something to that effect. But there are always those who seem to have that effect or maybe more like cause and effect. And, you know, sometimes you, you cause that trouble. You are the effect of that trouble. And things just happen. Uh, they would ask you oftentimes, hey, where's your partner in crime? They see you. And they just recognize that, hey, this, this guy, he's one of those guys. Where's your partners in crime, you know? And uh, it's like uh, you are now in the same category. Uh oh, you know, they see you, there's trouble. He's, he, he's one of these guys that get into trouble. But just as you see with Paul, it seems like he was always in trouble. Everywhere he went, he caused dissension and he caused a stir within the community. Guys were in an uproar. Guys were trying to kill him. Guys were trying to hang him out to dry. And, you know, P Peter addresses the same subject in his first letter saying in 220, First, uh, First Peter 2.20, uh, but if you do what is right and suffer for it and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. See, so, you know, like, like, like a lot of you guys, you know, the guys that kind of lit up when I say, here comes trouble. <laughs> you knew that you deserved it, right? <laughs> You knew, that you, you knew that you were bad, you know, you were deep down inside, you knew that I wasn't such a good guy, I was bad, and you know, but you know, if God says that, hey, if you're walking in his will, you're walking in his plans and his purposes, and if you suffer for it, you probably, uh, and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So, you know, if you're walking in the light of the love of Jesus and, you know, all of a sudden, if people don't like it, people don't like it that you're sharing the love of God. People don't like it that you're loving on them. People don't like it that you want to pray for them. And, you know, most people say that when you ask them, can I pray for you? They say, yeah, but some people might just say, no, don't pray for me. I don't want you to pray for me. And, you know, they, they start getting mean and they start getting uh, this and that and uh, they want to antagonize things. But, you know, just know that if you endure it, this finds favor with God. And this is where Paul was at. Paul was a, a real bulldog. Paul really had a, a mission on his mind. But you may probably conclude that Paul had uh, much accrued to his account in the form of God's favor for his life because he really gave his life away. You know, I think that, you know, he probably had a business, a family, whatever he might have been. He had a standing within the community. He was a Pharisee. He was a Roman citizenship. Hey, he was a Roman citizen. He didn't care about all of that. You know, if it, only if he could use it to the furtherance of God's gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, in chapter 13, we saw Paul and Barnabas driven out of Pisidia, Antioch. Uh, in Iconium, Paul, after healing... A lame man, he was literally stoned and dragged out of the city, and he was left for dead. You know, they didn't like what was going on. Even after he healed the guy, they stoned him. And, you know, uh, they thought he was dead, and, you know, he, after a little while, he just got up, and he said he went back into the city, the, the word tells us. He was a glutton for punishment, and he wanted more, but he wanted more of the love of Jesus Christ to touch the hearts and lives of these people. Uh, without hesitation, you know, the mission team continued on. In chapter 16 of Acts in Philippi, we, we find Paul and Silas beaten with rods, thrown into stocks in the local prison, uh, then only to be released and begged to leave because of Paul's Roman citizenship. You know, to be a Roman citizenship afforded you a lot of um, privilege. And one of those privileges says that hey, you couldn't be beaten, you couldn't be whipped. And, you know, the, guy, the, the guys that threw him in prison said that, hey, we're fearful because this guy, Paul, he, if he could, uh, he could complain to the Roman legion and maybe they'd come down on us and come down on our case because Paul is a Roman citizen. You know, so uh, that citizenship afforded him a lot of uh, latitude with some of these folks. But catching up with us now in chapter 17, Paul and his mission team being in Thessalonica, 
being caught in a feeding frenzy of those opposed to the gospel. Remember, it seemed like wherever he went, trouble followed along. And these guys wanted to cease, uh, him to cease preaching the news of Jesus Christ and preach the, uh, cease preaching the teaching of God's love for them. Uh, uh, they, they were opposed to the gospel. Uh, they were sent to Berea where, although received with gladness, the Jewish agitators catching up with them, Paul being put abroad on a ship and sent to Athens. Hey, Paul was a, a worldwide traveler. He says, you got to get out of town because these guys, they want to kill you. And you know, I, 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 you, you may know a few guys like that. They had to leave town because hey, they were in a bad position. They ripped off the wrong guy. They burned the wrong guy. And you know, they were looking for you and they wanted you know, an ounce of uh, revenge. But you know, these Jewish guys, they, they didn't like the thing of this Jesus Christ. They thought that he was a heretic and they thought that hey, he's teaching the things opposed to the law of God. And they were, in, were entrenched in that, and they said that, hey, we got to do away with this guy. But here we find Paul in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, starting in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him and as he was beholding the city full of idols. And Paul was... a uh, was one who didn't know the word relax or lay low till we get there. You know, they said that, hey, just wait for us. We're coming. Don't, don't go into the thick of things. But he didn't know how to do that. Within Paul was a spirit that, that was fired up for the preaching of God's word. And Paul was so on fire, guys. And here we find a man who the Lord had saved out of his deep, deeply entrenched commitment to Judaism and the way of the Jewish tradition. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was an amazing student of some of the top uh, uh, teachers of that time. To a point, he was a persecutor of Christians. His education and zeal proved to be a formidable opponent to those who had given their lives over to Jesus Christ. To the point that he ravaged the church, causing many, uh, 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 chasing many down and putting them into prison. You know, I, was, uh, I had a little note penciled in my Bible. Um, that word ravage uh, literally means to outrage, to corrupt, to waste, to destroy. Paul was on a mission to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, guys. He was so, uh, he was so filled with hatred. Here, uh, 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 here and now here in Athens, Paul was uh, stirred as the Lord... Uh, as he looked around the city, which was full of effigies representing various gods. Uh, we find Paul in this uh, similar circumstance in, in 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue of the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Paul in this similar circumstance in the synagogue, reasoning with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles. Remember, it was his... Uh, it was his thing to look for this synagogue where there were a lot of Jews meeting there. They were meeting there to sing, to pray, to have fellowship, and to study the tenets of God's word. There were those open to the things of God, and there were those uh, probably anticipating that hey, the Messiah would come, the Savior would come, and we're looking for the Savior to come. So he had an open door. Uh, 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 to, to go in and to preach Jesus Christ as, as not only Lord and Savior, but as the Messiah, not only of the Jewish people, but of the entirety of the world. He went in first to the synagogue, then he went into the marketplace. And, you know, he says that hey, we go, we're going away from the brick and mortar building of the church. We're going out to where all the people are. We're going to the beaches. We're going to the highways, the byways. For me, it was the waterfront, you know, going down and working with the guys on the waterfront. Uh, in, in the marketplace of humanity, in the marketplace of humanity where people might be engaged one-on-one -on -one or in a similar or more informal group setting. You know, uh, it, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, there's no fear of going into church. There's no fear of, you, you remember, do you ever had guys that say that, hey, if I walk into your church, probably the lightning bolts are going to come through the building <laughs> and strike us dead, you know. <laughs> but, you know, if you're on the outside, if you're in this marketplace, it becomes less fearful. It becomes less of a thing that, hey, I'm being confronted, I'm being confined, 
in a building. It might be something like having a Bible study out at the park. It might be a, a Bible study under the tree. It might be a, a time of open air preaching on the sidewalk, down on the beach, wherever it might be. You know, God is interested in hearts and lives. Wherever it is, God is there. And uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as we preach his word, as we preach his love. In 18, uh, there were some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some of them were saying, what does this I I idle babbler wish to say? Others seems that he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. For the Greek at this time, the, uh, the think tank of uh, the, the talk of sin, death, and resurrection seems so far out there. It seems so far-fetched. Remember when you, before you uh, received the Lord, if somebody talked to you about sin, then you, you might have said, okay, well, I could be a bad guy, possibly a bad guy, but ah, not so bad. <laughs> and you know, the sin, you, you calling me a dirty, rotten sinner, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, do all that bad stuff, but you know, sin just says that, hey, I'm separated from the love of God. Sin says that I don't have a personal relationship with him. Sin says, sin says that, yeah, I don't know him and he doesn't really know me and uh, we don't have this, uh, this intimate fellowship. And uh, uh, you know, it's like the, the days that guys used to say, hey, you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you thought, what is this? And you know, for the Greek mindset, for the Greek philosopher major, and we all grew up with these Greek and Greco-Roman thought schools of thought guys. Uh, it was so far out there, and uh, uh, they just assumed Paul was just spouting off, and things were so far-fetched, it seemed like nonsense. And, you know, I, I, I've shared with you that at times when Christians would come and talk to me, I said, oh, you guys are nice people, very clean-cut, very upright, and so and so on and so forth. But I said that, hey, this Jesus you're talking about is so far out there. And I'm not such a bad guy. I, th I think... Uh, I can merit and get in on my own. But in 19, he goes on. They took him and brought him to the Aragopagus, saying that we, uh, we know that uh, what you are teaching and uh, which you are uh, proclaiming. May we know what you are teaching or proclaiming. Uh, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know, therefore, what these things mean. They brought Paul to this place, which was apparently a forum where ideas and thought could be discussed and debated by some of the so-called philosophers and deep thinkers. And these guys were giving a lot of thought to things. These were learned men who were interested in finding the truth. Many of these given over to the many gods of the world and the fanciful teachings that were taught as men of knowledge and wisdom. Hey, we got all this knowledge. We got all this wisdom. I don't know uh, if you guys have seen that movie, God's Not Dead, you know. And there was that philosophy teacher who was trying to debate with the Christian, the young Christian student. And his thoughts were so way out there and so way overboard that he couldn't receive the simplest, uh, simple message of the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, these guys that he were talking to were Epicureans. And, you know, this Epicurean guys believed in... They were fond of sensual pleasure of eating and drinking. And I think they were in that thought school of, if it makes you feel good, do it, you know. If, you, if, it, if it makes you feel good, smoke it. If it makes you feel good, drop it. If it makes you feel good, shoot it, you know. And you know, that, that's where our society is. You know, a lot of uh, these guys went off the track. They went off the rails. They started toking on those joints and smoking these and dropping these uppers and downers and you know, uh, uh, we, we had uh, a run of heroin several years ago, and it comes and goes. You know, now we got fentanyl, and it, you know, it's coming into our islands like crazy, you know. So, uh, but these Epicureans say that hey, if you take this little green pill, this little blue pill, it's going to make you feel good. So, yeah, they say, yeah, I want to feel good. So, you know, this is what the Epicureans were about. Uh, the Stoics were... Um, uh, they were a certain school of philosophy, but when you think about that word stoic, it kind of just really says it all. Oh, isn't that guy kind of stoic? And you think, hey, what does stoic mean? Oh, he seems like such a smart guy, but he's so serious, and he's ingrained in his own thought, in his own little world, and he's way out there, and he's a little weird, but hey, maybe that's how you might describe a stoic. They think they're so smart. 
they're smarter than the average bear and you know um, there's not too many guys like that sometimes we're so smart we cannot receive the simplicity of the thing that Jesus came he was born of a virgin he walked this earth he died on the cross for our sin and he rose again on that third, third day and whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life you know it, it, it's so simple yet so profound yet it's so hard for that one with that mindset that says hey how is that going to work it's impossible one plus one equals two two plus two equals four and uh, Jesus come, coming as, as born of a virgin and walking this earth and dying on the cross and being raised again on that third day just doesn't make any sense to my mind. Can you show it to me on paper? Can you prove it to me? Can you be on a shadow of a doubt? And that's what we think, you know, we need evidence. And much as today, some still seek the truth and many uh, seek fulfillment and satisfaction. Many looking in all the wrong place. Do you think about that? You see the guys on the street walking past and they, they look like they're happy, they look like they're all nice and everything's good and everything's uh, hunky-dory. But you know, sometimes you know, deep down inside there's always that thing yearning within that little spot within the heart that says, hey, I need a little bit more. Maybe if I take that pill, I'll find that little bit more. Maybe if I have that other relationship, I'll have a little bit more. Maybe if it makes me feel good, you know, I can take more and I'll, I'll feel good forever. And you know, the thing with Jesus Christ, if you take him once, you die to yourself once and you born again to that living hope, hey, you always have that fulfillment, you always have that love, you always have that joy. And though the world might be just collapsing down around you, you think that, hey God, you're still in control, you still have a plan. And you know, when I th thought about that Lahaina Luna football team, I thought about all these kids, they're playing not for their school, well, they're not playing for their school, but they're playing for their community, they're playing for their people, they're playing for their homes that got burned up and the families they lost, you know. And I was thinking that, I wonder if the other team threw the game, but I don't think they threw the game. I think they played just as hard as they would have, you know, should this uh, tragedy have never happened. It's just that, you know, uh, these guys, these kids played their heart out and that's how it is, you know, 40, two to zero or something like that. It was a big score. And I think everybody in the stands, even the other side, they were all cheering for Lahaina Luna. See, so, you know, it's a, it's a thing that um, God, you know, out of this stuff, I don't know how you make sense out of it, but God is the one who's doing these things. God is the one that brings the fulfillment, the satisfaction, and God is the one that we look to rather than looking in all the wrong places because, you know, we have, they were showing on the TV, hey, how does all the fentanyl come uh, into our islands? And they show the flat rate boxes. <laughs> I said, oh, we just had three flat, flat rate boxes coming from the mainland too. But they were filled with stuff, you know. <laughs> Scrubbage, I call it. <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But uh, uh, again, uh, the things that, uh, that come in, we can't search every box. We can't search every container. How do the fireworks come in, the illegal fireworks come in every year? Uh, the illegal fireworks keep going off every Saturday night. We got illegal fireworks in Salt Lake too. <laughs> and these are illegal and they're trying to get your neighbor to squeal at you. And then, uh, and, and they say, oh, the stevedores got out of fire. <laughs> Don't blame the stevedores, you know, come on. But, you know, the, these container loads of fireworks come in, and, you know, uh, uh, these are the things that happen. But, you know, uh, fulfillment, satisfaction, oh, that one spot that was empty, ah, oh, you know, all of a sudden it's filled with the love of Jesus Christ. And no matter what goes on, you know, he's there with us. No matter what goes on, He's in the midst of all the chaos. He's in the midst of all the distraction. I mean, all the distraction was uh, definitely of the enemy, all the confusion. But bring, coming through it, you know, uh, it was uh, the love of Jesus Christ that brought many through and are, is still making many to break through. In 21, uh, he says, now these, uh, uh, now these Athenians and strangers visiting the same there, visiting there, used to spend their time 
uh, in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. You might say this place was a think tank of new thoughts, and you hear that word think tank, oh, they have a think tank. And you know, sometimes you think that, oh, these, where, where do they come from? Do they come from that place in California where they have all these new inventions and computer whizzes and computer giants? Or are they hanging around down at the beach down in San Diego, you know, fighting for turf, fighting for waves? What are they, you know? Are they hanging around at the drive-ins? Are they, you know, what are they doing, you know? Are they hanging around in these places with all the low riders and stuff like that? And, what are they thinking about these new thoughts? But he goes on in 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Aragopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects, that while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And they had so many gods. They had so many little gods set up. They had so many altars. They had so many figures. They had one altar that says, hey, we want to cover everything. So this altar, this, this altar is dedicated to the unknown God, the one that we might have missed. The one that we might have missed. And you know, you can go around Honolulu, you can see a lot of gods all over the place. Uh, I'm amazed, you go into the Chinese restaurant, the Vietnamese restaurant, you see the fruits out there, you see the incense burning, or you go into any regular business, you see the cat. Or you see this, you see this, uh, this fat doll, you know, and they say that, oh, he represents wealth. Ooh, we better have more of those. <laughs> and you know what the Bible says about the idols? He said, hey, you make those idols, you, they kind of, you, you look like them, or they look like you, what, whatever it is, you kind of look like that. And you, you, you kind of think that there's idols all over the place. And, you know, you hear the gongs bonging early in the morning at these churches and so on and so forth. But you, you think that these guys were all looking for uh, things in the wrong place. And uh, 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 he, he goes on in, 21, uh, in 22, and uh, he says that Paul stood in the midst I, I, I observed that you were very religious, and I saw you, were, you had this altar of, uh, to an unknown God. Uh, therefore, uh, what therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God that, who made this world and all the things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, verse 24, does not dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life and breath to all things and he made from one every nation of mankind to live all in the face of the earth having determined their appointed time and the boundaries of their habitation and that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him and though he is not far from each one of us I love it that, that Paul actually um, refers back to Isaiah 59 I'll read for you if you, like, you want to turn there Isaiah 59, it says in verse 1, Behold, the hand, the Lord's hand is not so short that he cannot save, neither is ear so dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. Here's that, that word again, that, that three-letter word or four-letter word, sin or sins. That sin that says that hey, we don't know God. The sin that says we haven't acknowledged Him. The sin that says that hey, we worship before that cat. We bow down before that cat. You know, or we bow down before that fat guy and rub his stomach, say, hey, give me some of that. Give me some of that money or whatever it might be. But sin has separated us. And he goes on to say that uh, uh, in verse 9 of Isaiah 59, Therefore justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. Oh, we live in the dark. We love the light, but we live in this darkness. For brightness we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. And it's kind of like, yeah, I got to feel my way around. And a lot of guys, they're so, self, they're so filled with self and self-confident. I know exactly where I'm going. I don't, don't you see I've done it my way and so far it's good. And, uh, but we grope around the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble in midday 
as in the twilight. And among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. And you know, you can, you can be the star athlete, you can be the life of the party, Mr. Mr. Uh, Universe and Miss, U Miss World. Uh, you know, you, you look good, you look, you're doing great and all that. But on the inside, verse 11 says, we all growl like bears. Whoa. You know, and I told you that the bears at the, the, the Waikiki Zoo, they used to look so sad in their big furry coats and they'd be in that small little pool trying to stay cool and you kind of think that those bears were just kind of groaning on the inside. Hey, we want to be in the wild. We want to be chasing the gophers and we want to be eating the wild blueberries and all that kind of good stuff. But here we are in this little enclosure with our little pool and we got no place to go and nothing to look forward to. And that's like the people of the world, guys. We got no place to go and nothing to look forward to. So we kind of grow, we moan sadly like doves. And you know, have you kind of heard a, 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 a dove kind of just cooing softly? Like they saw, like throw me a piece of bread, throw me something. And you throw him a piece of bread, the minor bird rushes in and grabs the bread and the dove gets nothing. The dove keeps looking around and kind of just moaning and groaning. And that's how people are, guys. The world promises us stuff, we see it, but as soon as we go for it, it gets snatched away. Only the love of God is the one that, you know, he reveals himself to us. He says, your iniquities have made a separation, your sins have hidden. God's hand is not so short, he cannot save, neither is ear so dull, he cannot hear. So if you know, we, 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 we cry out to him, he's responding. You might be here today because God has been speaking to your heart that says, hey, you, know, you need a little bit more. I want to reach out to you and maybe you're responding. You take a step of faith. You're here. And you want, you want to say that, hey, maybe what those guys say is true. Maybe what I've heard is true. And, you know, all of us were there. At this one time we were resistant, but somehow God gave us that little push. Well, by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. That little bit of faith that took you to get up and get here and, you know, um, say that I want to come and see, check this church out. I want to do this. I want to do that. And that's just a little bit of faith. God was giving you that little push that we might come and say, hey, by, by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It wasn't of ourselves. We had nothing. Remember our study on Wednesday night? We came, Solomon came with hands lifted up to the Lord. They were empty because what he was saying was, I got nothing to give to you, God. I have nothing. I am empty. I'm bereft of any good gift, anything good. I'm looking towards you to fill my hand. I'm looking towards you to bring some ordination for my life where I'm filled with the good things of the love of Jesus Christ. And he says, we moan, we growl like bears. We moan sadly like doves. And Isaiah was a very profound guy. And you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, he goes on, he said that he saw there was no man, verse 16, and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Way back then, before the beginning of time, God saw that there was no one to intercede on our behalf. Who was going to come and speak on our behalf? Who was that one, that intercessor? Or the Holy Spirit, right? He's the one that comes to speak on our behalf. And he was the one to intercede. But then his own arm brought salvation to him. His own arm brought salvation to him. Can you see that? There's, there's a couple of different guys he's talking about. Maybe the arm of the Holy Spirit, or the arm of God the Father, uh, giving to the arm of the Son of God. You know, he says, hey, here's salvation. His own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him. The righteousness of God, you know, upheld us, uh, upholds us and upholds him, guys. Here it is. Sim separated us. Uh, back to Acts 17 real quick because... Uh, uh, verse 28 says that uh, for in him we live and move and exist and even some of your own poets have said for we also are his offspring you know the, these, these Grecian uh, philosophers said that hey we recognize that we must be from God you know our own poets say this uh, being the offspring of God we ought to not think of divine nature as like gold or silver or stone an image formed with the art and the thought of man and uh, in him we live, in him we exist, in him we are created. And, you know, uh, uh, 
I used to wear this little golden tiki around my neck, and I thought that, oh, I should put a, a, a couple of rubies in the eyes because it would look so good. But, you know, once I got saved, I lost that tiki. I said, oh, I wish I had that tiki, but it was not a nice piece of jewelry, but it was an idol that I had around my neck. And I says, oh, it's cool. It's like the idol I got on the, the tiki I got on the nose of my surfboard. You know, it, yeah, it's all good. And somehow in my heart, I, I want to get this old antique Kamaka ukulele. It's a concert ukulele. It has a tiki on the headstock. And you can't find those. <laughs> but I, I, I don't need it. But I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of neat. They, got the, they, they have an actual tiki on the headstock. And it's better that I didn't get one of those. I, I, I got one from the second-hand shop, you know. But anyway, uh, uh, we think that uh, their thing, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance. See, now, now Paul is saying, hey, you guys are ignorant, you know. <laughs> Ignoramuses, you know. You had no God. You had no knowledge of God. And God in his graciousness is now making you aware that there is a living God and he's there to hear. Uh, because he has a fixed day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men, raising him from the dead. Therefore now when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some began to sneer, but others say, we shall hear you again concerning this. Paul went out of their midst, verse 33. Verse 34 says, some men joined him and believed, among who was Dionysus, uh, the Aragopagite, and a woman named Demaris, and others uh, joined uh, uh, with them. You see the three responses, guys. Some began to sneer. Some began to say, hey, we'll hear you again on this. But yet the third category of guys are there were those who followed along. So, you know, we, we may be in different and varying places at any given time. We may have been as those that sneered they, they say that, oh, I'm smiling at you, but really on the inside, I'm sneering at you because I don't believe what you're telling me. Others said that, oh, yeah, okay, I come again. I, I'll, I'll listen again. And, you know, there was something stirring, but others just joined right in. So, you know, you, you might be in a place that, hey, you're, you're one of the guys that joined in. Hey, wonderful. Praise the Lord. You might be one of the guys who... Uh, who maybe on the inside, you, maybe you're still moaning softly. You're looking good on the outside, you're still moaning softly, but let me think about it. And you know, you might be as those kind of antagonistic towards the gospel, so wherever you are. But if you're here today, I'm saying that God is working, God has a plan, and God wants to be your personal Lord and Savior. So it's a good time to receive Him. And, um, we're going to probably give you an opportunity as, as uh, we receive communion uh, to receive the Lord. So uh, why don't we pray? And the worship team is going to come up, and we're going to do another song, and we're going to receive communion. Father God, we thank you for this, this day again, Lord, and we thank you for the message, your word, Lord, and we thank you for the word of the cross and the word of Jesus Christ, which brings hope and life and uh, uh, there's nothing fake about him, Lord, and uh, you're the, the real one. Even as the guys say out on the street, hey, for real. Yeah, Jesus is for real, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your great faithfulness, your great love. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen.